thought today we'd have a look at one piece of evidence for the Roman army and the wider Roman world and look at it a little bit, but also look at the problems of understanding just what this data, what this information tells us. So I thought we'd start with the career inscription, a memorial to a centurion and his son, who'd also been a centurion. And this is Petronius Fortunatus, and it was found in near the site at Lambysis, the, the base of Legio III Augusta in North Africa, and commemorates a local family who obviously have a tradition of service within the Roman army, at least for these two generations. It's not a new inscription. It's been around for quite a long time and it's been included within all sorts of studies of looking at the Roman centurionate because it's surprisingly detailed and impressive in the number of different units that the main man commemorated on it um, served in during his career in the Roman army and the sheer fact that he served for 50 years in the Roman army. So even if he'd been 16, 18 when recruited, that still puts him well into his late 60s. Now, he's not the longest serving Roman soldier we know about. There are a few other inscriptions that record men who seem to have been at least on the books of a unit for even longer. So, you know, from the start, you get all sorts of questions raised. But let's just consider his career a little bit. And you'll have to forgive me for checking my notes because this isn't the sort of thing I can remember off the top of my head. Not completely. So he tells us that he served for four years in the legions in successively the ranks of Librarius, Tessararius, Optio, and Signifer. And then he was made centurion by the vote of the legion. That's quite an interesting thing. That's a phenomenon that there are hints of elsewhere, but it's one of those few clear cases. Now, obviously this is a man who most scholars would say had served in the ranks of the Roman legion, though we should note he doesn't mention service as, as an ordinary miles, and he goes through four different posts in just four years. So he's doing this pretty quickly. Now, the Tessararius, Optio, and Signifer, again, the order varies. Normally, we tend to think of the Optio as senior to the Signifer, but that's not the, the order they're given in here, and perhaps things varied a little bit um, from time to time, unit to unit, and in individual cases. These are the Principales, the, um, the senior subordinates within the century, beneath the centurion, who is the commander of the century of nominally 80 men or so, so company strength, perhaps by today's standards, relatively small company, but certainly historically that's, that's broadly within the range of many armies from the 17th, 18th century onwards. The company of 60 to 100 men is fairly common. So 80 as the Roman theoretical strength fits well within that. So he goes up quite quickly. Now we don't know anything apart from that, his supposedly the vote, the approval of his comrades, the other soldiers, gets him the post of centurion. Now, we know from later in his career, he wins several decorations through direct military service. We don't know what's going on at this stage. Is this in peacetime? Is this in active service? What's happening? And the impression is that this is someone who is clearly favored from early on. The fact they've got these posts, Libar Librarius is a sort of clerk, bookkeeper type of responsibility, probably more at headquarters level than at the, the level of the century, though again, we don't know all the details of how the administration worked in the army. Now that in itself tells us, as does his subsequent career, that the man is, is literate, presumably quite competently literate. Um, but again, why is, does he rush through these ranks? One problem we have is that so many centurions, when they commemorate themselves, just mention service as a centurion, and we don't really know or have that much detail about what happened before, assuming there was a before. So you've got Petronius Fortunatus, he's got four years, and then he moves um, into a succession of legions. And we just go through these and where we think they were. We cannot date this inscription precisely, but we'd guess at an early third century date because one of the legions in which he serves was formed by Septimius Severus. So he serves in second Parthica. Severus doesn't form those until the 190s, the first, second, and third Parthica. So that, at least means that in that, that's the penultimate unit he, he lists. So it's perhaps near the end of his career. So it could just be that he's one of the first men serving in that unit. But even so, we can't be too sure. So the succession of legions is this, and we'll go through the legion and where we think they were at round about this time. Now, again, 
because we can't precisely date it, there might have been some variation as units were detached to serve in a war elsewhere or sent either in, in their entirety or more, like, more likely as at large vexillations to other provinces to support the units in the army there for whatever purpose. But what he says is this. First of all, it's Legio First Italica. Now, nor for most, most of the time in this era, they were stationed in, on the Danube, Lower Moesia. And then he goes to Legio Sixth Ferrata, and they're in Syria. Then he goes to First Minervia, which is in Lower Germany. Now, that would be to the north, as we understand it. Remember, upper and lower, like closer and further uh, in relation to Rome, rather than we're used to a map with the north at the top and everything going down from there. After that, it's 10th Gemina, Upper Pannonia, and then 2nd Augusta in Britain, not based at Caelia, not far from where I'm, I'm recording this today. And then 3rd Augusta, back in Numidia, so back close to where this inscription's found, perhaps the homeland for Petronius Fortunatus. 3rd Gallica, that's Syria again, so for the second time. 30th Ulpia Victrix, again, that's Lower Germany, again, going to that province for a second, second time. Then 6th Victrix, which was stationed at Eboracum, York, in northern Britain, so second time back in Britain. Then 3rd Cyrenaica, which takes him all the way out to Arabia. And then 15th Apollinaris in Cappadocia, so past Syria and to the north, eastern Turkey today. 2nd Parthica, which is stationed a lot of the time in Italy, but is also follows Septimius Severus around on his various expeditions. So that could be operating in the east in his Parthian Wars, could be coming to Britain. It, it really depends on the date and assuming that um, Fortunatus is in the unit so close to when it's formed. He could be significantly later, in which case, again, probably Italy, but this unit does move around. It's treated as a sort of reserve army for the emperor when he goes on campaign. And it's stationed near Rome as well as a sort of counterweight to the Praetorian Guard and their influence. And then finally, first the Deutrix, which is somewhere, one of the Pannonias, so somewhere on the Danube, either upper or lower Pannonia. So that's a succession of legion after legion dotted around the empire. If Petronius Fortunatus, each time he got a promotion or each time he got a transfer, we'll come back to which is which, went to those where the legion was stationed, then he would have moved around a lot. He would have seen a substantial number, the greater part of the military provinces of the Roman Empire, he would have visited during the course of his career. Now that's interesting, um, if that's how it's happened. We don't know, he doesn't say at any point what um, rank he is in each, each of these legions. He doesn't give, you know, we know, for instance, there's a title for the centurion of each particular century in each particular cohort. So you get your cohorts numbered and then you could be Hastatus posterior, Hastatus prior, Princeps posterior prior, Pilus, all these things with the centurions of the first cohort. He doesn't mention rank of achieving the first cohort, so he doesn't seem to get up to the the primi ordines, the, the five most senior centurions in a legion. But on the other hand, we have to assume there's a reason for all these transfers. Now let's just put this in contrast with his son's career. His son unfortunately died fairly young, but he's also commemorated on the monument, and he's Marcus Petronius Fortunatus, and he served for only six years in the legion, he joined at the age of 29, so you know, quite mature, and served in two legions in that time. So he's in um, 2nd Augusta and 22nd Primigenia, um, in reverse order, I've gone the other way around. So again, might have come to Britain, um, but then dies, dies young at the age of 35. Now, there's no mention of cause of death, but that's not unusual for Roman tombstones or funerary monuments. It's, it's the exception rather than the rule if someone's described as drowned, killed in battle, killed in war, killed by bandits, anything more specific. Normally, you just say you lived this long, you died. After, and if, you're in the, if you've been in the army, you'll say you stipendia so many years of military service. So we don't know. He could have perished in war, in battle, in accident, in, um, you know, we hear of an optio from Chester who drowned. Um, there are lots of perils in the world, but of course the biggest killer 
in the ancient world remains disease and you know contributing to it things like food poisoning and all this sort of thing where people are careless so probably more likely than not he died of natural causes but we don't know the striking thing is he doesn't serve anything like as long as his father and he starts his career very late and he doesn't list any other responsibility below the rank of centurion so if you take the inscription literally then the son of this man who's been a career centurion for 46 years goes straight in promoted and directly commissioned as a centurion at the age of 29 has a six-year military career before he's um he perishes in some for some in some way or other so that's a very different career pattern and it it could be that for some reason they've chosen not to mention any rank below the centurion but that would be odd when with the father they have been quite specific that he was did hold these four posts and for four years and was then promoted by popular election which suggests that there's some degree of either he's he's done something that caused widespread admiration or the unit has been given a reward for whatever service of you get a promotion or several promotions and he's one of the men chosen for that that right he obviously had to have whatever qualifications so that's the basics we get we also hear about his decorations and he's um decorating the parthian expedition with the corona muralis now that's that might well date it to Septimius Severus's reign, which could mean he's in Second Parthica pretty early on. But um, again, you can't be sure because there are quite a few Parthian expeditions. And um, you want to know about that, give a quick plug. Eagle and the Lion or Roman Persia obviously goes through the history of all that in some detail. And earlier on, he had um, another decoration. He's got torques, phalari, all these various the sort of insignia you often see on the monuments of Roman centurions that could be worn in a harness over their body armor. So that's the basics of the career and it's no great surprise to see a centurion or indeed any military man from North Africa, from Numidia or the African province because these were very good recruiting grounds. A lot of Roman soldiers and a lot of centurions come from the area. So again, not a surprise and these people do get posted around because that's the nature of the Roman army. So nothing too unusual there. As I said at the start, rather unusual that he served so long. Now, you can see this in lots of different ways. Again, he doesn't tell us why he's transferred around all these different legions. Now, people could speculate that he has a specialization Petronius Fortunatus was particularly good at something. Maybe he was an engineer. Maybe he was very good at training troops. Maybe he was very good at administration, bookkeeping, logistics, keeping the, you know, the supply train of a force working. Any of these things or something else that we can't think about um, and don't know was just considered particularly reliable. He's kept in post. He never seems to get quite to the top of the Centurion Eight, but he's kept in service for a very long time. And he's obviously been seen as a talented or favored soldier from the start because he's been promoted to Centurion after these four years and after very rapid progress through this succession of posts. So he's got some experience of how the Legion works before he goes to be a Centurion and then he continues in that rank for a long time. So you could see this in a very positive way, that this is someone who is a specialist who is very capable and therefore the army recognizes his merit and keeps him on as long as it can because it's useful to him. Now, you know, a man in his late 60s serving in the army is not going to be as fit and strong as he was when he was in his 20s or 30s even. He could still be pretty tough. Obviously, he lasts a long time. He lives longer and he's more fortunate than his son who dies comparatively young. So it could be that this is um, something that Fortunatus himself actively wants. This is a man who's keen to serve, who's a, a very serious professional soldier, follows this as a career, likes doing what he's doing, likes the army, and stays in for a very long time. Now, we get no definite idea of whether centurions were expected to serve for a fixed term. They don't seem to have been required to do the, the 25 years of an ordinary soldier, but we don't really know. Um, and it does seem to be an appointment thing, but plenty serve for less than that. And 
some serve for more, some for even longer than Fortunatus, but again, we don't really know because most don't necessarily tell us these sorts of details. And particularly when we're on those inscriptions that simply mention that someone was a centurion and we don't know were they other things in the army before they got to be centurion or did they go straight in as we know that some did and as apparently Petronius Fortunatus Jr. did. So we can see this in a very positive light. This is the army recognizing talent and making best use of talent and sending him around the empire so that you can spread good practice, capability, and um, you know somebody's, somebody's skill, somebody's experience can be used in lots of different places. Now, obviously on several occasions, he comes back to a province where he's already seen service before. Again, assuming he actually goes there. On the other hand, if we're just looking at this career as a career and we think, well, this is very long and this is someone who never quite gets to the highest ranks of the centurionate, let alone gets to be primus pilus of a legion, gets elected into the equestrian order as was normal, and in some cases they go on to commands in the Praetorian urban cohorts and even to be prefects procurators of the smaller equestrian provinces or even somewhere as important as Egypt. You know, some people do that. They tend to go through the centurionate rather quicker than Petronius Fortunatus did, but again, he's centurion a long time. So you could, you could have the positive view of this, that this is an army that's recognizing talent and keeping talent, holding on to it, rather than letting good, experienced men go, making sure they have best chance to use their skills, but also hopefully pass some of those skills on to the next generation of soldiers. Or you can look at it in a rather more negative way, and you can see this is a sign of stagnation of someone who moves mostly sideways or makes small steps in promotion and stays in the army because he hasn't earned enough money to leave. He's not wealthy enough to set up his, him, himself and his family as sort of country gentry and be the local aristocracy, the local bigwigs, and last that way. So you could also look at this as, say, the US Army before or after the Civil War where promotion is very slow, it's largely dead men's shoes, and you might move around sideways quite a lot, but you're not actually getting up to the highest ranks that quickly. It's so hard to tell. We just have this record of one man's career, and we compare it to all the other centurial inscriptions we have that tell us about other men's careers and other details, but we don't really know what's going on. We don't know what the Romans considered to be normal. What's What's, what can we read between the lines? And there are lots of different possibilities, and it's always worth our while as scholars considering all the options. It doesn't mean we have to say, yes, I've solved this, this is what it's like. And instead, this was poor Petronius Fortunatus slogging on year after year when he was far too old, really, for military service, simply to support his family, trying to do the best for them. And he didn't have much choice. And he was also still perhaps an ambitious man who was hoping to get the big break, hoping to get to the highest ranks and beyond, but never quite made it. And this was an army that didn't have the opportunities that simply tended to force people to stay a long time in their post. Again, the same evidence can be made to read in a completely different way. But there are lots of other questions simply from this record. Now, we've listed all these legions where this man served, and I've given the provinces where we think the legion probably was for most of the time anyway, even if, as I say, we can't be specific about when this career is actually made and when he's actually doing things. So therefore, there's some, some possibility that some of those um, regions is not actually where the Legion was when Petronius Fortunatus served with them. But there is, of course, another possibility. The obvious thing is to say, well, when Petronius Fortunatus is promoted to Second Augusta, that he physically travels all the way from his previous posting on the Danube uh, with 10th Gemina um, and goes to Britain and serves with Second Augusta in Britain, whether at Iscusilorum, at Caelia, not far from me, whether with detachments dotted around the province. He has enough time, given he's 46 years, that he could spend several years in each of these postings. There is time to do this travel. There is time to spend a meaningful, significant amount of time, several years of potentially campaigning seasons or of major projects like building, whatever it might be, in each of these provinces. But there is another possibility that this transfer was largely made on paper or in the records that in some shape or form, Fortunatus gets a step in, perhaps in promotion, in prestige within the Centurionate. Remember, we don't fully understand 
how the grading system worked and just how much difference there was between the Pilus Prior of, say, Cohort 3 and the Hastatus Posterior of Cohort 7. Whether there was a distinction between which cohort you were in as well as which century you were in as to seniority or whether it was more down to the particular post, whether you were Hastatus Posterior or Pilus Prior or anything in between or whether it was also your individual service, the amount of time you'd spent in the army, the amount of stipendia that gave you status compared to everybody else. But it's possible that he has moved on paper whilst Petronius Fortunatus served somewhere else doing something else. So he may have moved around far less than this in that he could have been one of those many centurions that we know are detached on specific duties. They can be the man whom Pliny mentions in Bithynia in the early 2nd century who's controlling traffic and regulating that through Byzantium. He could be a regional centurion, a centuria regionaris, which of course if uh, people have read my Ferox novels is a, something I, I use for those stories. But we hear of these people in Britain, we hear of them in Egypt and elsewhere. They're effectively local authorities, marshals, policemen, military figures, but also representatives of the, the government, the empire itself, within an area. Now we don't know how many of these were out there, therefore how many were required to be provided by the units. We do know from strength returns that many men were detached. They weren't always with their parent unit all the time. We know of men who are posted to the governor's staff of each province. You know, centurions are useful. They are literate, accomplished, confident individuals with a fair degree of prestige and rank who can be used for all sorts of tasks. And they also turn up helping civilian building projects, acting as specialists in that respect. So. Again, we could come back to the idea of Petronius Fortunatus as a specialist who follows a career and is moved from legion to legion and is on the books of different units because they have a vacancy at the right level of prestige, rank for him and perhaps gradually to reward him with steps in status, but that he doesn't ever physically go to serve with them. Or sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. Again, all of that's possible from exactly the same evidence and uh, you know this is just trying to consider the range of ways we can understand and explain what's going on with this one apparently simple if detailed inscription. There's also something else which is to move beyond Fortunatus and to look at how all this happens because whether or not he physically went from Syria to Britain to Cappadocia to Arabia to Numidia for each of these postings, whether he is physically with that legion when he's on their books, when he's attached to them or not, records have to be kept. There are a fixed number of centurions per legion. We as yet have no direct evidence for a centurion who is simply given the rank but doesn't have a connection with a specific unit. He belongs to a legionary uh, to, a, to a legion, he belongs to an auxiliary cohort, he belongs to the fleet or to the urban cohorts, Vigiles or Praetorian Guard or whatever it might be. We don't know of anyone who is simply centurion and is still in active service and does things. You appear to have had to have occupied a post. So that means that there's a clear limit on the number of people who can be centurion at any one time. And in the case of the legions, when there's about 30 legions, 60 centurions in each, you're talking about 1,800 or so people. Now, there are probably slightly more legions, slightly fewer at various times. And depending on whether there's a centurion commanding the legionary cavalry, whether there are five in an enlarged first cohort or six in an ordinary sized first cohort, you know, there might be a little bit of variation, one or two either way. But basically speaking, that's the sort of number we're dealing with and probably a similar number of um, auxiliary centurions, though theirs is a different career path and a different um, organization. And then you've got the, the Rome cohorts, the, the urban cohorts, Praetorians and the like, um, that will add several dozen more. You're still talking perhaps a couple of thousand legionary and Italian units, 4,000 or so if, if you include every century and in every different army unit in existence at the time. So that's the sort of numbers you're dealing with. Now somebody is keeping records of posting someone from a legion that's stationed in Syria to one that's stationed in Britain, say, 
or Lower Germany or wherever, wherever it might be within each individual case. So you have to think about a system that records this, knows where there are vacancies and then fills those vacancies and which might create vacancies in other units and fills those accordingly. All of this has to be recorded, it has to be organized. And it's pretty important. This is a, a significant task because one thing that no emperor wants is for a provincial governor to go around promoting lots of new centurions, men who are in charge of troops and more loyal perhaps to the governor than they are to the emperor um, at the time. And if you look at the um, trial of Calpurnius Piso, who's accused of having been expelled from being proconsul of, uh, sorry, legatus of Syria by Germanicus, after Germanicus' death, returns to the province and starts to try and form factions within the army. Again, promoting men without permission is a serious worry for the emperor. And centurions are important people. You know, they are significant. Whenever we have descriptions of a civil war and mutiny of legions or changing allegiance of legions, it's the centurions and to some extent the tribunes that tend to be in the lead and tend to control what happens. So you don't, as emperor, just trust anybody to go around making people centurions. And this is clearly an organized system. And yet we don't really know how it was organized. There must be, whilst we have hints of administration being conducted in Rome, it is not really that detailed. There is a mention of centurions postings, tribunes postings, this sort of thing. But again, we don't really know the detail. Just how is someone selected? Petronius Fortunatus tells us that he is recommended by the vote, by the choice of his fellow soldiers, by the rest of the legion. Um, presumably that's the fellow soldiers and not the centurions of the legion getting together and saying we want this man promoted because he's good, because he's performed this service, because he's brave, whatever it might be. We don't again quite know the detail of just what that vote, that selection involved. But it does mean that someone then has to know and record this and accept this because another thing that's involved in all this is a centurion gets substantial rights in terms of pay and um, legal advantages and a bounty when he finally leaves the army. So all of this has to be recorded in the same way that the citizenship granted to auxiliary soldiers when they're honorably discharged after their full term of 25, 26 years, again is recorded. You know, we have these diplomata, these doc bronze copies of documents that are in Rome because these people are becoming Roman citizens. And the Roman state for centuries has been very, very careful to record who is a citizen, what property they possess and everything else about them, their, their status socially, all this sort of thing. This is extended to the army. So there is clearly a shadow of a central organization that is controlling and regulating all of this. And at the very least, keeping track of it. Now, how it's done, how recommendations come in, presumably via unit commanders, provincial governors, and then at what stage they are approved and men actually get that step in promotion. I mean, we have the, the case, the man who drowned from, uh, who's recorded at Chester, was an optio ad spem. Optio with hope, with promise of promotion to the centurionate. And we, we tend to think of that naturally as, well, he's waiting for a vacancy. But you have to wonder as well, has he, is he waiting for a degree of approval? as well, that he will get that formal recognition, yes, you now have this rank, you are commissioned as centurion. There's a lot more going on that is not recorded in our sources. It's just, as I say, the shadow there. We have a sense of this very complicated organization that isn't simply moving whole units, whether cohorts or legions or large detachments around the empire is required and making sure that when they get to where they've got to, to be, they are paid, they are fed, they are equipped. They are given orders and instructions. They are housed where necessary. But this is a system that's tracking individuals. And we know from Roman army records that every individual recruit, even animals, horses, mules and the like, are documented from the very start of their service until their discharge. This is presumably even more detailed in terms of the more senior people like centurions. But also you could extend this when you look at the equestrian officers, the prefects, the tribunes, and beyond, as well as, of course, the provincial governors, there are still substantial numbers of these people. And whilst an emperor might know, at least to a degree, every senator and therefore be able to judge his suitability, loyalty, whatever, when it comes to um, deciding on promotions and postings, there's got to be a level of detail, a level of control, even if it's done via patronage at different levels, people recommended 
for the equestrian officers, but also coming down to the centurionate at the very least. Now, we don't know how promotions work and how those are recorded lower down, though again, units are producing documents. They're going to list everybody by their rank. And at least some of these things, are, these returns are going into um, provincial governors and their headquarters. Therefore, there's the impression is of a far more complex and efficient organization that some scholars are rather inclined to see the Roman army and the Roman Empire as primitive, as crude, things like this as symbolic. It, it simply doesn't work. You know, this is clearly a system that works, probably wasn't perfect, probably was open to corruption. We have, of course, the, the famous joke from Juvenal from his sadly un, um, incomplete satire about military service of how important it was for a recruit to come up with letters of recommendation. Again, you would think that somebody like Petronius Fortunatus, unless there is someone out there with a remarkable eye for talent and merit, has come well recommended, hence his fairly rapid um, procession through Librarius to the Principales ranks, Tessararius, Optio, Signifer, and then Centurion in just four years. Now, I say just four years because obviously from a scholarly point of view, we're thinking we're looking at people's careers and we think, well, that's not very long, but obviously that's that's the equivalent, many people would go to university today, three or four years to do a degree. That's quite a large part of your life. And, you know, even if he, say, had one year in each of these posts, yes, that's quick, that's very rapid, but it's still 12 months or so in each post. So again, a reminder that we have to look at this from the human point of view. Now, we could then see with his son that perhaps it's having had a father who's been pretty successful and certainly has served a very long time as centurion. Again, we don't know. He doesn't get to the very top. We don't know quite how far he got and whether, again, comes back to the, the explanation for all these postings. Is he someone who's become very good at something and he's known as the engineer, the trainer, the organizer, whatever it might be? His son goes in at an advanced stage. Most people would not start a military career. So they certainly wouldn't start it in the ranks at the age of 29. You get the impression that the family has done well enough. And perhaps this is someone who's been employed in local civic life up until that point. Um, but again, nothing is mentioned. So we don't know. This is speculation. So I hope what I've done by looking at this one inscription, this man and his son's careers, is try to explain a little bit of the process that we go through as scholars in trying to look at the evidence for the past and then suggesting different ways we could look at this, different ways of understanding this lost world of the Roman Empire, of the Roman army. And again, reminding ourselves that there's so much we don't know. And we can come with assumptions that we all have because we've We've been trained, we've been taught, we've read all the scholarship on a subject, and we tend to, it's often very useful to think in a set way about how things happen. There are usually fresh ways of looking at it, and it's always worth considering the possibilities. That's not an argument for re rejecting all the orthodoxy just for the sake of it, but it's also an argument, it is an argument for thinking about that, for saying, well, okay, that's what we assume, but are there other possibilities that could work just as well with the evidence? Because in the end, what we come to, as with, with any academic discipline, is best guess with available evidence. And the available evidence we have for the Roman army and the empire is incomplete. There are so many gaps, and there are so many gaps as about the things that the Romans would simply have taken for granted. They would know how this was done. So a Roman would probably look at this inscription, and if he had some knowledge of the army, he could guess fairly quickly, okay, I know where this man has been, I know um, which units he's been with, but I can also guess maybe he hasn't actually been with them physically, he's been doing other jobs and simply taking steps in promotion or making way, getting transfers to um, other units. There would be much that they would understand that we cannot. So it's, it's our job to guess and to explore the range of possibilities. So centurions are tend to be treated fairly simply because we, we don't get their point of view. That's This is the closest we get with inscriptions like this. We don't have one of them writing a story of his career in the Roman army, an account of that. It'd be wonderful if something like that ever turns up, but it's extremely unlikely. These are not people on the whole who got to write texts that survive. They may have written them at the time. And we don't know so many details about the local circumstances of the family and how People like this with a military tradition in their family fitted in more widely to the community in the province. 
But again, it's, it's simply a question of, we put together all these different bits of information, but each one needs to be thought about. All these options need to be considered. So that's a little bit of a few thoughts on Petronius Fortunatus and his son.